This presentation is part of a lecture series on the C++ programming language by Michael Adams at the University of Victoria in Victoria, Canada. Uh, for those of you who might be interested, a copy of the slides for this lecture series can be downloaded from the website whose URL is given at the bottom of this slide. This presentation constitutes a work in progress. It's definitely far from perfect, but hopefully it's of sufficient quality to serve as a useful resource for learning C++. For the benefit of those of you who may be relatively new to programming, including many of my students, I'd just like to make a few comments regarding the examples that appear on these slides. Often, in order to make an example short enough to fit on a slide, it's necessary to make a lot of compromises in terms of good programming style. So some of the deviations from good programming style that are demonstrated by these slides are such things as uh, frequently formatting the source code in utterly bizarre ways in order to save space, uh, not including any comments in the code, using short meaningless identifier names, and so on. So these things are truly evil. Do not ever do them in real code, but understand that for the purposes of examples and fitting them on, onto slides, it's necessary to do some of these truly evil things. In concurrent programming, one of the major challenges is synchronization. That is, we need to ensure that threads perform various operations with the correct relative timing. And to this end, we need a variety of synchronization primitives. So far, in terms of synchronization primitives, we've considered mutexes. In the slides that follow, we'll examine another kind of synchronization primitive, namely condition variables. In concurrent programs, the need often arises for a thread to wait until a particular event occurs. For example, consider a thread reading from a disk. The thread issues a read operation to the disk, and then it needs to wait for the data from the read operation to become available. The thread could wait by simply spinning in a loop, repeatedly checking if the data is ready. Uh, because the disk, however, is very slow, compared to the processor, the thread may execute millions of instructions in a loop, simply checking if the data is ready yet. And this constitutes a very inefficient use of processor resources. It would be much better if the thread would simply block and then only resume execution after the data is ready. And this is exactly what a synchronization primitive known as a condition variable allows us to do. So a condition variable is a synchronization primitive that allows threads to wait by blocking until a particular event occurs. And there are two basic operations associated with a condition variable. There's a wait operation and a signal operation. A thread that wants to wait for an event performs a wait operation on the condition variable, which will block the thread until it's awoken. And a thread that wants to notify one or more threads of an event performs in a signal operation on the condition variable, which will awaken the signal threads. Now let's consider a simple example in which a condition variable might be used. Um, suppose that we have a FIFO queue where one thread is writing elements to the queue and several threads are reading elements from the queue. When the thread attempts to read an element from the queue, if the queue is empty, rather than having the thread spin in a loop waiting for the queue to become non-empty, we want the thread to block instead. So to accomplish this goal, we use a condition variable to signal the condition that the queue is not empty. In other words, the queue has some data available to be read. If the thread attempts to read from the queue and the queue is empty, the thread then performs a wait operation on the condition variable. And when a thread adds an element to the queue, the thread also performs a signal operation uh, to indicate that the queue is not empty. This use of a condition variable will allow threads reading from the queue to block until the queue is not empty. And I need to make one additional comment about threads awakening from a wait operation. Uh, when a thread that was waiting on a condition variable awakens, the thread must still recheck the condition associated with the condition variable because it might not be true anymore. So for example, when the thread awakens in this example, it would need to recheck if the queue is still not empty. And the reason for this is because that between the time that the thread was signaled and the time when it was awoken, another thread could have come along and consumed the data in the queue, in which case the queue would, would be empty again. Um, if upon awakening the condition associated with the condition variable is no longer true, this poses no practical problem as the awakened thread can simply perform another wait operation. There's another reason for needing to recheck the condition upon wake, awakening from a wait operation, in some implementations of condition variables, 
uh, spurious awakenings are permitted. And a spurious awakening simply means that the thread that's waiting on a condition variable can be awoken without a signaling operation having been performed by any thread. So for this reason, it's also necessary to check the condition associated with the condition variable, condition variable upon awakening, since the condition is unlikely to be true in the case of a spurious awakening. In the standard library, the class condition variable is one class that provides the functionality of a condition variable. Objects of the condition variable class are neither movable nor copyable, simply because it wouldn't make sense to move or copy such objects. The class provides three variants of the wait operation, and these are provided by the member functions wait, wait for, and wait until. The wait member function performs a wait operation, blocking the calling thread until the thread is signaled or a spurious awakening occurs. Each of the wait for and wait until member functions performs a wait operation with a timeout. In other words, the calling thread is blocked until the thread is signaled, a spurious awakening occurs, or the specified timeout period elapses. In the case of the wait for member function, the time period is specified by its duration, while in the case of the wait until member function, the time period is specified by its endpoint in time. Since condition variables are used in conjunction with shared data protected by a mutex, a thread invoking a wait operation would need to be uh, holding a mutex for synchronizing access to the shared data. Since the thread should not block while holding a mutex, a mutex is provided to the wait operation so that the mutex can be released before the thread blocks. So for reasons of exception safety, a mutex is specified to a wait operation using a unique lock. The lock must be held by the thread invoking the wait operation, and then the wait operation atomically releases the lock and blocks. At the end of the wait operation, the thread unblocks and then the lock is reacquired. The class provides two variants of the signal operation. These are provided by the member functions notify1 and notify all. The notify1 member function signals one thread waiting on the condition variable, allowing the signal thread to resume execution, while notify all signals all threads waiting on the condition variable, allowing all of the signal threads to resume execution. When awakening from a wait operation, the thread must always recheck the condition associated with the condition variable, and this is really for two reasons. First of all, spurious awakenings are permitted, so that a thread can awaken that was blocked in a wait, even though no signal operation may have been performed. In other words, the condition variable might not have been signaled. And also, between the time the thread is signaled and the time it awakens to relock the mutex, it's possible that another thread could have come along and changed the state of whatever the mutex was predicting so that the condition associated with the condition variable has changed from what's expected. Uh, concurrent invocation is allowed for notify one, notify all, wait, wait for, and wait until. In other words, the condition variable class provides the necessary internal synchronization to ensure that all of this works with no problem. And lastly, the notify one and notify all functions are atomic. On this slide and the next, we have a summary of the members of the condition variable class. So to begin with, we have a member type, native handle type, and this is a system-dependent type that gives access to the underlying type used to represent condition variables by the operating system. With respect to construction, destruction, and assignment, really the only thing to make note of here is that objects of type condition variable are neither movable nor copyable. Next we have the notification and waiting member functions. So first of all we have the notify one member function. This function signals one thread waiting on a condition variable. Then we have the notify all member function. This signals all threads that are waiting on a condition variable. Then we have the wait member function, which blocks the current thread until signaled or a spurious awakening occurs. And then we have the wait for member function, which blocks the current thread until signaled or a spurious awakening occurs or the specified timeout duration passes. Then we have the wait until member function, that blocks the current thread until signaled or a spurious awakening occurs or the specified time point is reached. 
And then lastly, we have one other member function, which is native handle, which gets the native handle associated with the underlying object used by the operating system to represent a condition variable. On this slide, we have an example of using the condition variable class. If we look at the code in the example, there's a class called int stack, and this class represents a stack of integers. The class has a very basic kind of functionality that it provides. There's a member function called pop, which allows us to pop an element off of the stack, and the value that's returned by this function is the value that's popped off of the stack, which is of type int. We also have a member function called push, which allows us to push an element onto the stack. And this member function takes a single int parameter, which is the value that we want to push onto the stack. And the idea here is we want a class that we can use with multiple threads at the same time. And we want the pop member function to have the property that if we try to pop something off of the stack, so if a thread is calling pop and it tries to pop something from the stack, and there's nothing on the stack, Rather than having the thread spin in a loop waiting until there's data available, we instead want to block. So we're going to use a condition variable in order to achieve this. If we look at the data members for this class, there's a data member which is a vector of int, which is called v underscore. And this is used to store the underlying stack data, in other words, the elements of the stack. And the last element in the vector is the top element in the stack. We have a mutex called m underscore, and this is going to be used to protect access to the, the uh, vector data. And then we have a condition variable called c underscore, and this condition variable is going to be associated with the condition that the stack is not empty. If we look at the code for the, the pop and push functions, both of these functions need to be able to access and potentially manipulate the data associated with the stack, in other words, the vector of ints that's storing the elements of the stack. Because of this, we need to protect the accesses to the underlying stack data with a mutex in order to ensure that there's no race conditions or data races and so on. So let's look at each of the pop and push functions in a little bit more detail. If we look at the pop function, the very first thing we do inside the pop function is we create a lock object of type unique lock and this lock object is associated with the mutex m underscore. So when we create this lock object, this is going to acquire the mutex m underscore. So after this construction completes of the lock object, we now hold the mutex m underscore. Then we proceed to do a wait on the condition variable c underscore. And we specify for the mutex associated with this wait operation, the lock object that we just created. And we're going to provide a predicate to test. This is the condition that we want to keep waiting until this condition becomes true. And essentially what's going to happen is when the wait member function is invoked, what it's going to do first, it will test this condition that we specified, which is essentially checking if the stack is not empty. So it will check to see if the stack's not empty. If this is true, then wait will just return immediately without blocking because the condition that we're waiting for is already satisfied. If, however, this condition is false, what will happen is the wait function will atomically block and release the mutex associated with this lock. And we will stay blocked until either there's a spurious awakening or the, the condition variable is signaled. In, in one of those two cases, the, the thread will wake up. It, we're, it's still executing inside the wait function. And what the wait function will do, it will then test this condition again. If this condition is true, then the wait function will return. Otherwise, it will block again and atomically release the, the mutex associated with this lock. And basically, this process will continue until eventually the thread resumes execution. It tests this predicate, and the predicate returns true, saying that the stack is not empty. And then the wait function will return. So when the wait function returns, we know that we currently hold the mutex associated with this lock. And also we know that the condition here is satisfied, that the predicate is satisfied. In other words, the stack is not empty. Since the stack is not empty, then we know we can safely pop an element from the stack. So we get the last element in the vector, we save its value, then remove it from the vector, and then return that value. When we hit the return statement, just after the return statement executes, as we're leaving this function, in other words, as we, when we hit this brace bracket here, the closing brace bracket, because we've reached the end of the lifetime of this lock variable, the lock variable is going to be destroyed. And when this happens, in other words, at this point here at the end brace bracket, 
since the destructor for lock is called, the mutex is going to be released. The mutex is associated with the lock, so m underscore will be released. If we look at the push member function, the very first thing we do inside the push member function is we create a lock guard object called lock, which is associated with our mutex m underscore. So when the, after the lock object is created, we now hold a lock on the mutex m underscore, so we know that we can safely execute code which modifies or accesses the, the shared data without having any problems of race conditions or data races and so on. So now that we can safely access the underlying vector data or stack data, we push an element onto the stack, the one that was passed as a parameter x, and then after we do this we pr perform a notify or signaling operation on the condition variable c underscore because since we've just pushed an element onto the, into this vector we now know that the stack is not empty we just added an element to the stack so this means since the stack is not empty we need to signal other threads that might be waiting to let them know that now this the stack is not empty anymore so we call notify we call notify one because we're right now we're only adding one element to the stack so really we can only guarantee that one thread could actually read data from the like pop an element from the stack so we call notify one rather than notify all and then when we reach the end of this this function here we reach the end of the lifetime of this lock object which means the destructor is called so at this point the mutex m underscore will be released With the condition variable class in the standard library, the wait operation must be provided with a lock of type unique lock instantiated on the type mutex. But sometimes you might want to use a different mutex type, and if you want to do this, then you need to use this other condition variable type in the standard library called condition variable any. So this type here What's special about it is in the wait operation, it allows for any mutex type meeting certain, certain basic requirements to be used. Otherwise, the interface of condition variable any and condition variable are essentially the same. If you have a choice between the condition variable type and the condition variable any type, condition variable type is preferable because it will tend to be more efficient. So only use condition variable any if you really need the extra functionality of being able to use an arbitrary mutex type.